We are born again, according to the Scriptures, to a living hope. We are alive in Christ. I was just uh, in Jerusalem at the tomb, which is empty. He is not here. He is risen. And uh, I was just reminded of the reality once again of the resurrection, that because Jesus lives, we live also. We are alive in Jesus Christ. Amen? It's Easter every day. Uh, and uh, by the way, coming up this year, uh, and a number of you have asked for this, so here it is. We are taking a Journeys of Paul cruise from Rome uh, throughout the beautiful Aegean Sea, all points uh, uh, followed by Paul in the second, third missionary journey over to Athens and Corinth and around uh, biblical studies as we go. Great time, great fellowship, and that will be, save the date, October the 20th through the 31st, October 20th to 31st, we would love to have you go with us. Take your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and the title of this message is Entrusted. Deb Graham is actually writing a book, and it's a wonderful book. The title of her book is Entrusted, and it's all about what we are talking about today, and that is the trustworthiness of a life that is given to Christ, the integrity of a life that believes and follows Jesus, entrusted. Ch chapter 4, verse 1, this is how one should regard us. So if someone is looking at your life, this is about you, this is how you should be regarded. As a servant of Christ, that's one, and stewards of the mysteries of God. So a servant, a steward. And a steward of the mysteries of God, which is the Word of God, the revealed Word of God. And then look at verse 2. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. Interesting phrase, found faithful. It means to pass the test and to be found faithful. To be discovered, uncovered as faithful, found faithful, entrusted. In fact, one of the translations of these verses says that a, tr a, a servant and a steward should be found entrusted. And so we are entrusted. A steward is one who is entrusted with the possessions and the uh, properties of another. It is a word which is akin to the idea of being a manager. In other words, as a steward, we don't own the property, own the possessions. We are doing it for another. And as a steward, we have, you have one job. We say to a field goal kicker who misses it, you had one job. You have one job as a steward of Christ, and that is to be trustworthy, to be faithful to God. If you were just writing some synonyms down, and I would encourage you always to take notes, but if you were writing words that uh, mean the same, uh, words like dependable. Dependability, someone said, is the greatest ability. Dependability. But not only dependability, but responsibility, and yes, accountability. It means to have integrity, to have character, faithfulness. It's a part of that rich cluster of the fruit of the Spirit, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and meekness and faithfulness. This is produced by the work of the Holy Spirit in us, Christ in us, God in us. And we know that God is a faithful God. God is is trustworthy. Don't just sit there. Say amen. amen. Thank you very much. God is a trustworthy God. For example, when we are tempted, and we're all tempted, it's common to all of us. There's a verse of Scripture, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. Mark it. Memorize it. This is a go-to uh, passage in your Bible. No temptation has overtaken you, but that is common to man. God is what? 
faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation will provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Thank God for the times in my life when I was tempted and God gave me a way of escape because God was faithful. God was there in that moment. But there have also been times when I yielded to temptation and so have you. So what happens then? 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, what? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He never fails to forgive. You've never sinned as a believer, your, your life covered by the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ. You've never sinned, listen to me, as a believer and had to say, well, I sinned that time and that's unforgivable. God can't forgive that. Or God wouldn't forgive that. God won't forgive that. No, God is faithful. God is faithful to forgive us our sins when we agree with him that our sin is wrong and confess it and ask him to change our hearts and change our lives. He's faithful every day. We get up in the morning, the dawn greets us, the sun comes up. There's never been a sunset in our lives, but that there has been a sunrise in all the tests and trials of life. We meet his mercies according to Lamentations chapter three. We meet his mercies every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. So God is always faithful. Considering our salvation, I love uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12, and it even includes our word of the day, which is in trust. But I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I believe. I know Jesus, and I am convinced that he is able to guard that day which has been entrusted against that day which has been entrusted to me. In other words, in view of eternity, the day we stand before Christ, I know, I know, I know because I know Jesus that he is able to hold me, to keep me. I am not saved by my faithfulness, but by his faithfulness. He is holding. Now you're doing really good. You're getting the amens rolling this morning. Those of you watching online, you can even say amen. Jump up and down, whatever, wherever you are. But we are to be faithful. Now, because of the faithfulness of God, we are motivated to live faithful lives, to live trustworthy lives, to live entrusted each day. And today I picked, picked three categories. I could talk about a lot of areas, arenas in our lives where we are to exhibit this kind of trustworthiness. But I've chosen three. One, trustworthy in our walk. Two, trustworthy in our worship. And three, trustworthy in our wealth. First, our walk. Our walk. I'm talking about our Christian walk. Because you are a follower. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are walking with him. And as we walk with him, we are called to his character, to be dependable, to be trustworthy, to have integrity and honesty in our daily walk. You know, integrity is what you say to yourself and about yourself. Honesty is what you say to others. Honesty is what we are on the outside. Integrity is what we are on the inside, character within. And just as uh, Paul is saying here, let it be said of you, or when people review your lives, let them say, there is a faithful follower. There is a faithful servant and steward of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because integrity, really, character, has been described as what you are when the dark, in the dark, what you are when no one is looking. That's trustworthiness. Who you are, what you are, when nobody but God sees. And that's one side of it. But it's also your walk, your character, when everybody's watching. And believe me, people are watching. You're a professed Christian, people are watching you. Your children are watching you, your grandchildren, your husband, your wife, your family, your friends, your co-workers. Everybody's watching. Do they find us? faithful. If I were to ask your wife, is your husband a faithful man? If I were to ask your husband, is your wife a faithful woman, a faithful wife and mother? 
Children, are you faithful children? I could go on and on. This is the kind of thing we're talking about. Several years ago, I had the opportunity, Deb and I, along with members of our family, to go up to Yellowstone National Park. I had never been there, and I always wanted to meet Yogi Bear. So I, uh, we scheduled a trip up there, but no, what I really wanted to see was Old Faithful. Because Old Faithful is a geyser. It's not the biggest of the geysers, but it is the most faithful one because every, there I am right there, every 65 minutes, boom, 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 bam. We waited about an hour. They told us on the clock when it was going to happen, and sure enough, right on schedule, that geyser came out of the ground, boiling hot water. It was beautiful. It was magnificent. And so they call it Old Faithful. Would to God that every one of us could be called faithful. Not the old part necessarily. But old faithful. I was, uh, I saw Mamie McCullough, one of our wonderful members last night at our Saturday evening service. And uh, she was saying to someone, she said, you know, today's my 80th birthday. But I'm going to tell everybody that I'm 90. So they'll be saying, oh, you look so young for 90. But faith, that's Mamie, by the way. All of us have gifts and talents and abilities that have been given to us by God. Certainly, we've been given our salvation. And with our salvation, spiritual gifts and talents, abilities that He provides, all the blessings, everything we have comes from God, including the breath in our bodies, everything we have, every good and perfect gift comes from Him. We are stewards. We're stewards of our body. We are stewards of our possessions, we're stewards of our families, and we are to be faithful. There's a popular, well-known political talk show host who announces every program with talent on loan from God. I'm not sure exactly what he means, if he's taking credit or not, I don't know. But all of us have talent that is on loan from God, and we are stewards of this. And like the Marines, we should be simplify, always faithful, always trustworthy, not partly. Man, how would it go if you told your wives you were 80% faithful? It's not going to go very well, let me just clue you in. And when it comes to our faithfulness to God, though we fail, our goal Our desire should be always to please Him in our faithfulness to Him. And I would say, I want to especially talk, you know, just regarding our families and being faithful to our families. We know in the culture the family is breaking down. No one has to give us more and more statistics on that. There's so much brokenness in our homes and our families. And part of the problem is this new war that now exists between feminism and masculinity and And uh, the Bible says in Proverbs 20, verse 6, ask the question, who can find a faithful man this weekend? It was the March for Life. 250,000, 300,000 women and men showed up to March for Life. It was very much underreported as compared to the March for Women or Women's March, which had less, I'm told, but was reported 15 to 20 times more. Not surprising. The fact is there's this There's this cultural battle going on, and we're hearing a lot today about toxic masculinity. Just what is that? And what is, what does it mean to really be a man? Because we're being told today that if you view manhood traditionally, then you are suspicious. Uh, In other words, you must be You must be in some way a sexist, a misogynist. You must be a bully. You must be an abuser. And there is quite a bit of toxic masculinity in the culture today. I just call it bad men. But the answer to bad men is not to emasculate men or to fin up feminized men. What we need is not a feminized man or less than a man. 
We need a better man. And the only way to be a better man is to be God's man. A Christ-like man. Now, there are, there are lots of caricatures of, you know, what a man should be. You know, it used to be the Marlboro man. Is that what I'm supposed to be, just smoking a cigarette and acting tough? Well, you know, last night there's a picture here I want to show you of Jarrett Stevens preaching last night. And he, he brought his smoking jacket with his Bible, and uh, he also preaches now and travels with compression hose. But nevertheless… Not because you smoke or act tough or look tough. That's not what I'm talking about. I like the idea of a tender toughness, kind of like a a velvet-covered brick. That's what a man ought to be, a velvet-covered brick, strong on the inside. Because I tell you what, women don't want weak men. Women want a man that can be a hero, that can stand for something, that can stand for truth. Everybody appreciates someone that will stand up for righteousness, that will stand up for truth, and stand up for what is right. You know, tomorrow is, uh, tomorrow is Martin Luther King uh, Day, and uh, we celebrate uh, this man on his birthday. I brought a quote from MLK, and it's a good one. It says, uh, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. And I like that quote because it reminds me of one of my favorite verses in the Bible, which says, we overcome evil with what? That's what we're doing with our pregnancy center. There's a great evil, and it's abortion. And we ought to pray for the ending of this thing in our generation. And I've been saying a long time that millennials, the younger Christians in our generation, have a chance to actually end this travesty. They do. We're making progress. I read some uh, number this week. I, it sounds maybe a little bit untrue. I don't know. But it says only 7% of millennials believe in uh, pro-choice as it is believed by many in political parties, some political parties today. So I don't know. I do know that we're winning the battle of the hearts and minds of people in this culture of death in which we live. But the way we're overcoming it is to, is to not with hatred, but, but with love. Our, our goal as a church is never social justice. That's not the final goal. Justice is the goal. But we're not just about social justice. Here's what we're about. The great commission of the Lord Jesus Christ to make disciples, to rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them from pity and sin in the grave. That's who we are. And yet, Jarrett shared some incredible information. Uh, A a survey indicates that 75% of Protestants, including many Protestant pastors, could not identify the meaning of, get this, the Great Commission. Only one in four Protestant Christians in America could say, I know what the Great Commission is. No wonder the church is sick. No wonder we're falling behind the grade curve in terms of reaching our culture with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The way we do it is to overcome evil with good, is to overcome hate with love. And that's the kind of man I'm talking about. That's the kind of woman I'm talking about faithful to God and faithful to one another. I could say a lot more about that, but let me just challenge you, men and women, to choose to be trustworthy. Would your family say that about you? Would your friends say that about you? Would God say that about you? One job, faithful. Second, trustworthy in our worship. Are you faithful to worship with your church family? I'm talking about with the word worship, I'm talking about all things worship, and that specifically means the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are living in a generation of churchless Christians. That's an oxymoron. But we have Christians who are churchless, who are free-floating like 
free-range chickens. I never knew what those things were on the menu, but just free-floating. They're, they're churchless. I'm talking about professing Christians who are fringe, not faithful. I got to tell you, as a pastor over 40 years now, I, I've just never been able to get my mind around this whole thing uh, of being a Christian and being fringe in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and not faithful. No accountability, no responsibility, no dependability, no discipleship, not living in community, in fellowship, witness is minimal, prayer life is dis indistinct. You don't see them regularly. And if you don't, you know, many today, you know, just attend churches and go here and there. And there's a time to attend and visit and pray about where you're going to settle down and be a member of the church. But, you know, at some point, make a decision. The problem is for so many people, if you don't make a decision on that and you're not a member of a church, guess what? You don't have to attend. You don't have to give. You don't have to serve. You don't have to witness. You just hang. And you know what? You're on the take. You're on the take, just along for the ride, like a hitchhiker. You're like that person, that person at lunch every day that never pays. Now, if this makes you mad, you can apologize to me later when you get over it. But you know I'm telling you the truth. Two kinds of people in life and in the church, they're the givers and the takers. And it's all about consumerism. We consume religious content. Now, we appreciate the opportunity to be online with people watching all over the world. And many of you cannot get here. I mean, you live somewhere else and, and uh, many of you are bedridden or you're sick or you couldn't get out. We understand that. That's one reason we do it, is to have an online presence. We have an online pastor, and you can connect in prayer. And PowerPoint ministry, same way. PowerPoint is our radio and television ministry that ministers to people all over the world, thousands upon thousands of people. But we always say to those who are watching, to those who are listening, find a local church and get active in that church. A screen is no substitute for a pastor and a church and a ministry and being involved. So don't just watch church. Some people watch church the way they watch sports. We're all excited about watching playoff games and the Super Bowl. We watch sports. And some people watch church. And you know what? The same result takes place. The people that watch sports, the people who watch church. We become fans. Fans. Fans of the sport, fans of our team, fans of our church. But Jesus never called us to be fans. He called us to be followers, and He called us to be faithful, faithful. Bud Wilkerson, the great coach of the Oklahoma Sooner years ago, he was describing football as 22 men on the field desperately in need of rest, being watched by 80,000 people in the stands desperately in need of exercise. So what happens if you just watch sports is you get fat, you get flabby, you're a sports watcher. And the same thing happens to you if you're just watching church in and out, watching a screen. You get fat and flabby spiritually. And when the heat gets on, you're not ready because you have not disciplined yourself and devoted yourself in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look, I cannot imagine life without this. And I don't mean this meaning me up here preaching, talking to you. I mean this, this fellowship, this worship. Gathering together each week with God's people in Jesus' name in the power of His Spirit, singing great songs of faith, worshiping from our hearts the Lord God, and hearing God's Word taught, and growing in our faith, and being challenged, and, and being encouraged, and being among other Christians, and share the community of faith, the best friends on earth, 
often more closer than even family members. That's why we say that church is not an organization you join, but it is a family you share. It is a life that we share together. It is a body. We are one members, but me, one body, but many members. And so we need the church. I, again, I can't imagine my life without this. I can't imagine not coming each week because that week just might be the week that the breakthrough in my life that I need takes place. And we come, we're faithful, not just when we feel like it, not just when we want to, not just when we have something, don't have anything else to do, not to be entertained, but to worship God and to please God and to be faithful, trustworthy. We've been given this wonderful, wonderful thing called the church. It's the only thing on earth that Jesus started. It's the only organization, if it is an organization, that Jesus, only, only ministry that Jesus ever started. And it's the only thing that's going to last when everything else goes up in smoke because he said the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. No wonder the writer of Hebrews, as we've been studying, said, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as is the manner of some, but encouraging one another. And watch, read that last slide. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. What day? The day of his return. These last days. I don't give you any hope to survive these last days unless you are a faithful part of God's church. You're just out there in the wind and you need Christ and his church. You know what it's called? Entitlement. Too many people have an entitlement mentality towards life. They think somebody owes them something. They're always just spectators and passing judgments. They're critics now. Now, we've always had spectators in church. I mean, I look back over the many years, decades that I've uh, been a pastor, we've always had spectators, you know, people that just come when they feel like it, as I've been describing. But now it is an accepted practice, an accepted practice to so many. And God is calling you up higher from being an attender, yes, to being a member. We today, so many people want anonymity without accountability. And they look for a church that knows and expects the least. You know, somebody said the most church, the best church knows you the least and demands of you the least. That's what people are looking for, a church that knows you the least and demands of you the least. We want to turn that upside down. We want to be the kind of church that calls you up higher, that loves you and knows you and expects the best of you. So are you faithful to your worship, faithful to your church? What would your children say? What would your grandchildren say? They're watching. And their practices and response to church will be much like yours. You need the church a lot more than the church needs you, I assure you of that. Because we all need God's church. We're to be present all the time, semper fi. One final word, and that is trustworthy with our wealth. Now, when most of people think about steward or stewardship, you think of what? Giving. And yes, giving is a big part of being a faithful steward. It speaks of money and material possessions. But in this consumer culture in which we live, a culture in which the average household now has 10 credit cards. More and more, you can just click and punch and in debt yourself rather than entrust yourself. You can in debt yourself to many buyers, sellers rather, and we live in a world which is motivated by money more and more. Some people tell their children, make all the money you can make. 
That's terrible advice. It's terrible advice to tell anybody to make all the money you can, especially your children. You know why? Because if you tell somebody, make all the money you can, they end up chasing money rather than chasing God. Make money, fine. God's given you gifts, and part of being a faithful steward would be being faithful at your work. That would be a whole other category. First one there, last one to leave. Be faithful in that. But, but our goal in life is not just make all the money we can. Our goal in life is to pursue Christ and His will. So we have a church filled with, or churches filled with religious consumers. I said, how do I know? Well, just check on how much people are giving. The average American gives 3% of their income to all charities. 3%. It's actually a little more than I would have expected. Just everybody. I say, well, that's low. Well, how about born again adult Christians? How many do you suppose? A born again, say they're born again, adult Christians give their tithe to their church. 8%. 8%. So 92%? X nay. Out. Say, well, a tithe, what is a tithe? That's, that's 10%, the first 10% of our income as a principle of stewardship in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. A tithe is, is giving at the basic level. You say, a tithe, that's a lot of money. A 10%, that's a lot of money. That's, that's a lot. Really? A dime out of every dollar for a God, a Savior who gave his life, who gave his all for you? Really? It's too much? So, well, that's all about the Jew in the Old Testament. Well, look, any Jew that would give more under the law than a Christian, or any Christian who would give more under grace than a Jew would give under the law is a disgrace to grace. We're all called to be generous givers, not entitled, entertained. You know, Christians uh, spend Here's a number, seven times more on entertainment than they do on spiritual activities or ministries. Not faithful. So we're really like the world when it comes to the way we're spending our money and giving our money. A selfish church cannot reach the world. A selfish church cannot reach people. Our goal is to spread the gospel to give away our lives, to share Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. And we don't need to be just giving a little bit. We need to start with 10%. And Deb and I, we talk about in our family a graduated tithe. That's growing your giving. So you start at 10%. You start there. And then you graduate your giving as God prospers you. And you move to 11%, and you move to 12%, and 15%, and 20%, and on and on as God would lead you. Now, okay, I see some eyes rolling back in their heads right now. And, you know, sometimes when you start talking about money, people, uh, you know, their blood pressure goes up, and they get all excited about that. There's a letter, uh, my friend Kent Hughes uh, quotes a well-known pastor who preached on money and And when the pastor preached on money, it prompted this anonymous letter. I was never so disappointed in a service as I was Sunday, she writes. I have an unbelieving friend that I got to come with me, and what were you preaching about? Money. I can assure you she was not impressed. And why money when there's so many beautiful things to say? You'd better reconsider such messages in the future. Leave money to God, and He will handle everything, believe me. I love this church and usually like the sermon, but that was terrible. Love those kind of letters. (laughs) And the letter was signed, a Christian who loves to go to church to hear the Word. 
It should have been signed, a Christian who loves to go to church and hear the word unless it's talking about me and my money. Because you know, we can't be ignorant about this. Jesus taught more about money than any other subject, including heaven and hell put together. It's true. Look it up. Google it. <laughs> Parables, messages, ministry said so many things about money. And so much of the Bible is about stewardship. Remember, a steward, we don't own it. We're operating it. We're managing it. We're overseeing it. We're like a house manager. We're taking care of the master's stuff. He owns it all. And he's never signed it over to any of us. He just gives it to us as stewards. Are you faithful with your finances? That's the question. And as far as preaching on money, I don't think I do enough of it around here. But let me tell you, I'm not being a faithful preacher if I don't preach to you the whole counsel of God. If I don't preach to you what the Bible says about stewardship and finances, I'm not telling you the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So, are you faithful with your wealth? And all of us are wealthy compared to the world, but I've been talking to, to you a little bit about read the red. You know what the red is? There's a red letter Bible editions where the words of Jesus are in red. All the Bible's inspired equally so, but the words of Jesus stand out. They're written in red, recorded in red. So let me read you some of the red in closing this message. Here's what Jesus said in Luke 16. Don't take my word for it, take his word for it. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. And watch this. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. People say, you know what, if I was just wealthy, really wealthy, if I had a lot of money, if I had millions, I could be a great giver. I'd be the top giver in the church. No, you wouldn't. You'd do with a million the same thing you're doing with a hundred or the buck that's in your pocket. That's what Jesus said. He that is faithful in little will be faithful in that which is much. And then he closed, verse 13, no servant can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. That's why I told you earlier, you can't just tell people to chase money because you'll start loving money more than you love God. And you know it's true. Jesus said, where your money is, there your heart will be. You put your money in the stock market, and that's fine. Put your money in your stock market, what do you do? You check your stocks. Why? Because your money's there. You invest in eternal things, you put your treasure in heaven, your heart will be there. And you care about eternal things. So, I close with two questions. Two questions that every one of us should ask ourselves and answer before God. Number one, can I trust God with my money, with my possessions? Can I trust Him? If I do what He commands me to do, if I'm faithful in my giving, in my, it, with my money and all things, and by the way, not just 10%, again, not just 10% belongs to God, it all belongs to God. So the way we spend our money, the way we save my, our money, the way we give our money, the way we use our money, that's all God. So can I trust God with my money? Would he be faithful to me? Has he ever failed you? Has he ever failed to provide for you? He says he won't. He, break, he doesn't break any promises. We have a Father in heaven who never breaks his promises. One of the problems we've got in America is this broken down family, it's fatherless America, and it's so many dads in particular who have broken their promises to their kids. But God's never broken a promise. I've decided that I can trust God with everything I have. So here's question number two. Question number one, can I trust God with my money? Question number two, can God trust you with his money. Can God trust you to give generously, sacrificially, faithfully? 
You are entrusted. And I'm asking you, as you stand before God, can you hear the words? We all want to hear it in heaven. Can you hear it now? Well done, good and faithful servant. Later on in this same passage, the writer Paul talks about, you know, judge no thing before it's time. You read it down, I don't know, about verse 6, I think. Don't judge anything before it's time. Give it time. Because when you invest in things, when you plant, you will reap a reward in time. Don't judge it before it's time. You trust God with what you give. And a rich reward is coming. And the greatest of all, and Jesus used this in a parable about money. Well done, good and faithful servant.